This is Common Sense Radio. Straightforward and no excuses. This is the Steve Gruber Show. Call me crazy. What I said was perfectly right and spot on accurate. Boy's got a mouth like a cannon, always shooting it all. Stop, 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 stop. 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 I mean, you're way off, Skip. Hey, boy. Yeah, you know, it's not cynical, it's common sense. Pay attention to me when I'm talking to you. Genuine, accountable, and raw. Here is Steve Gruber. And welcome to it, my friend. It's the Steve Gruber Show. It's Thursday, 6 after uh, the hour on this um, Thursday. If you'd like to get involved in the conversation, welcome aboard. The phone number is 888-999-66, 888-999-66. Love to hear from you. Love to have you on the on the phone, have a conversation with you. Uh, as you know, Hillary Clinton is headed to the Hill today. Hill on the Hill to talk. Um, well, she's there to be transparent. She's there because she wants to share her story, and she has been trying. She has been trying so hard to give everybody her emails and be transparent and damn it, if you would just listen to her, she can clear all this up. Uh-huh. Right. Uh, meanwhile, Joe, Joe Biden, the vice president, had, what a strange, what a strange and awkward press conference in the Rose Garden. Hey, here's a guy who, who <laughs> I don't want to run for president, but here are the several reasons I should be. It's like he was crowned homecoming king. And then was told he couldn't get the crown actually, but he had his speech ready. And they said, well, you can give your speech anyway. I mean, was that not an awkward, strange speech in the Rose Garden? I've never seen anything like it. It, it was, it was well, it was flat out bizarre. So you've got those things going on. And then Paul Ryan last night apparently makes a deal with the Freedom Caucus. Makes a deal with the Freedom Caucus. Who, who now say they will support him to be Speaker of the House, which is odd because last week they were saying he was far too liberal, too easy on immigration, too easy on, on, on other issues. And the hard right Goldwater conservatives are saying, well, he's not going to work for us. Well, apparently now he works. I'm trying to sort it all out for you and, and, and keep it all straight. Joining me now, Congressman Tim Wahlberg, uh, with his insights on the matter. Congressman, welcome back to the program. It's good to be with you. Uh, good to have you. Uh, all right, so here we are. Uh, let's uh, let's start with Paul Ryan. Uh, last time you're on the program last week, I asked you if you could support Paul Ryan. You said you certainly could. Uh, I'm going to guess that has not changed. Uh, but I guess the question I would have for you is, what about Paul Ryan on immigration? What about Paul Ryan on the national debt? What about Paul Ryan on some of these things where he is being criticized by those on the uh, the hard right? Well, I think you have to look at his whole record and. Uh... He represents a district of, I think basically I can say is exactly the same as mine in the makeup, a Democrat, Republican, Independent. Uh, it is a swing district, and he has secured that district by, uh, I think, uh, representing his district, being smart on those issues. But I think also the principle has come out with Paul. If you look at his, uh, his stance on spending upon uh, needing to grow an economy in order to pay off the debt and not make it a larger government, uh, I, I think we'd agree, generally speaking. Um, last night he was able to, and I just left Paul, in fact, uh, in, the, in the locker room of the gym uh, where we share, share space together. And um, he's still committed to going forward. This is something clearly he has not longed for, uh, but I think his heart showed the other, other day when he said, listen, uh, sometimes you have to step up and do what uh, needs to be done, and if I can be a unifier, then I, I will be willing to, with stipulations, I'm willing to be the speaker if you want me. If you don't want me, I can't be a unifier. That's fine, too. Um, but realize, America is on the precipice. Uh, another president that has a, a D behind his or her name will carry on the legacy of Barack Obama, and our country cannot survive that. I believe that's true, and that's why I support Paul, Paul Ryan. There are other good people in our conference, but either they don't want to run or they can't gain the support from the cross-spectrum that makes up the Republican conference here. So I'm committed to helping Paul to be as conservative as he possibly can be and still move this country forward. 
So let's talk about uh, where does you know Paul Ryan? Maybe he's a unifying force. We've had, in my estimation, and, and and I know you don't necessarily share this opinion, but in my estimation, we've had a very weak speaker for some time now. Uh, you know, and I think we have a a weak. Uh, majority leader in the United States Senate. I mean, let's be honest. Harry Reid was driving the agenda every day, day after day, day after day, in front of cameras, pounding at home, you know, making outlandish comments about how Mitt Romney had never paid taxes and other crazy things. But he got press every day, and he moved the agenda for the liberals to the to their Marxist end goals. And and and, and Mitch McConnell, I couldn't tell you the last time I saw Mitch McConnell in front of a camera talking about the the goals, the goals for. Uh, the Republican Party, the goals for this country. I couldn't tell you, sir, because he hasn't been there. He's not carrying. He, there, what is the Republican agenda, according to Mitch McConnell? And I'd have to say, I have no idea. Well, that's probably the best thing I think uh, you will appreciate uh, about Paul uh, in that he will be in front of the cameras. He's articulate, uh, he can carry on a conversation, he can talk uh, as wonkish as you need to, him to be wonkish, he can also talk a uh, high principle. Uh, with uh, with passion for a cause, not simply a vote. And uh, I think that'll be good. He is well committed and made that statement the other other night in front of our conference that uh, he will be on the talk shows. He will be voicing our message, and he indicated that has to be done. And Speaker Boehner was sitting just off to the left of him when he was making these statements, and he made them unabashedly, saying, listen, we have not carried our message to the people. We need to be out there, and I will do that. But he did say, I'm not going to be the fundraiser that this, this uh, past speaker was. I can't travel the country like John did. My commitment, my values are for my family. And so others are going to have to pick up that slack and assist me in it. But I will be out there speaking to the issues, speaking to the agenda, and letting the American people know that the Republicans do have an idea. And what I like, uh, Steve, is that he has indicated that for the first time we will indeed vote on a plan that's an alternative to Obamacare. We will indeed vote on immigration reform, but not comprehensive. He made that very clear. He said, we cannot move any type of comprehensive immigration reform that Republicans would support right now, but we can do certain things that the American people want, and so we need to do those. I like that, and I think, though it's risky, and we will but we'll here's, put here's my question, on our though. back, yet people know where we stand. Well, we need to, you know, there has to be messaging. There has to be a, a you know, a clear and articulated message and, and, and goals for the party. No question about it. But Paul Ryan also said, you know, I won't uh, put my family in second place. Is it a nine to five job, I guess is what I'm asking you, because some criticism coming from different corners says, listen, man, it's not a nine to five job. Well, it won't be a nine to five job. None of us in this job do a nine to five job. <laughs> None of us do a uh, five day a week job either. We make that sacrifice commitment. But I do appreciate the fact that he has values in the right place. And so he will not be traveling all around the country uh, raising money, which is important uh, if you're going to move a, uh, an idea forward. Yet uh, that's one thing he said. I will not give up my young family. I appreciate that. I chose not to run for Congress back in the early 90s because I had a young family. And when I found out they wouldn't, didn't want to move to Washington with me, I said, well, then I can't go to Washington, even if people would elect. So I'm going to stay in the state house. I'm going to come okay, home every night. Hold your thought right there, Make sure that my family is cared for. Right. Hold your thought right there. Congressman Tim Wahlberg on the program. We'll be right back on the Steve Gruber Show. Covering Michigan and the world from his bunker below the bridge. Here is Steve Gruber. All right. It's 18 after on this Thursday. Appreciate your support. If you want to join the conversation, it's 888 You can find out more at stevegruber.com. You can listen to previous programs. Uh, go to specific interviews. You can check it all out there. Uh, hear it all. And uh, like I said, stevegruber.com. You can also listen live. So wherever you're traveling, at the office or on vacation, you can click Listen Live and, and check it out every day. You never miss a day. See how that works? With us now is Congressman Tim Walbring. And Congressman, here just a little bit ago on the program, we had Bob Thompson on the show, the president of the Michigan Farmers Union. Uh, he and uh, many farmers around Michigan very upset uh, about this food labeling debate. 
saying that food labeling is is no hindrance whatsoever to free trade. I agree with him. You and I have had this conversation in the past. He said, in fact, he would want to label products that people in Michigan will buy Michigan products and Americans will buy American products and so on and so forth. And yet we get back to this uh, discussion about somehow food labeling is is a detriment to free trade. Um, What do you say to that, Congressman? Well, I say we we can do food labeling. There's no stopping. Uh, Various associations from labeling their food. Meyer, for instance, is into uh, letting letting me known about uh, various types of food, organic, etc. Though that labeling can be done, but when we're talking about uh, the general uh, export import situation, when you have uh, countries like Canada that uh, trade back and forth with us, that have their goods and products, and we have ours, and we want it to go that direction, and our farmers, our cattle growers, our, our dairy people want to make sure it goes that direction. There are some some confinements that we have uh, as far as the types of labeling, and then uh, there's also concerns in industry if you have to have 50 separate labels for 50 separate states. That can be a real problem and a cost factor that ends up uh, not well, right, but that's not what we're talking about. The fact of the matter is that some of these countries uh, don't want any labeling at all. Um, they don't want any labeling on the food. We want labeling. Well, we want to know where our steak comes from and our shrimp comes from. And if we're buying honey crisp apples, do they come from Michigan or the state of Washington? I want to know. Sure. And I, I, don't, and I, don't, I, don't, I think my family wants to know. And you can know that. But why the this, pushback? This, does, this why, doesn't why take does that some... away. You can still know that. And uh, uh, a, a shopper can, can carefully look and see what they're buying. Uh, we do that, and uh, th- that's not changing at all. I-, I think this is more of a tempest in a teapot uh, than-, than anything that will affect our health, our safety, and certainly our ability to buy homegrown goods. Well, then why can we not get the farmers on board? Why are Michigan farmers and the Michigan Farmers Union, um, why are they opposed well, enti- to this, um, it, this, this move? The Michigan Farm Bureau is on board. In fact, they're pushing for it. The Michigan Cattlemen's Association is on board. They're pushing for it. Um, so the major farm organizations with the overwhelming majority of farmers want this. And uh, um, Mr. Thompson has to deal with that and try to persuade the other farm or- organizations to go along, go along with him. So the country of origin labeling is now before the United States Senate because it has been repealed by the U.S. House. How did you vote on that matter? I voted uh, with the House on that matter. So you voted against country of, of origin labeling. What is wrong with country of origin labeling? Well, again, nothing wrong with country of origin labeling as long as it's done in a common factor that doesn't put unnecessary burdens on our export policy as well as upon the producers. Of the but that's idea. not what this dispute was about. This dispute was a, a dispute with Canada and Mexico and the World Trade Organization with threats of economic retaliation being doled out by the WTO. And, and then the House, with your vote, repealed the law, country of origin labeling. It doesn't have anything to do with Michigan labeling or, or what's going on. It, it has to do with us caving into Canada and Mexico because they don't want to compete with Kansas beef or Michigan apples is the way it reads to me. I mean, to me, that's what it says. But, that, but that's not true. It's the fact that we are exporting uh, hundreds and thousands of pounds of produce, of beef, of all sorts of agriculture products, and to, to make requirements that go in a different fashion from our, our country to another country and expect to have that common export trade that goes on that allows us to have expanded opportunity and certainly in a, in a trade situation allows other countries to have opportunities to trade with us. Uh, there has to be a common, common consent that goes on. And so the industry itself, the industry itself said, we want this because if we don't have it, we can't lead the world in trading in these products to Canada and other, other, other countries. In any agreement, the two sides or three sides have to agree on it. America still comes out ahead with this. We still are the largest exporter of these goods and services. That helps all of us, including the consumer at the cost. It doesn't stop uh, Mr. Thompson or others in labeling their products if they don't want to export their products and just want to send it to the American consumer, the Michigan consumer. They can still do that. That doesn't stop them at all. This just gives us really a leg up 
as it were, in our export policy, and in fact, helps us all. All righty then, and then, then, then there you have it. It's uh, 24 after, and I guess uh, we'll see how the voluntary uh, country of origin labeling uh, comes about. We'll see how that works for people. Um, I don't see how any labeling. I mean, we label everything: clothes, mattresses, car parts, everything. You know, and that doesn't seem to hurt trade. Or maybe we're going to stop doing that as well, Congressman. And, and it, to me, that's when I'm trying to support. Um, uh, America and Michigan buyers, I want to know where the things come from, and I think that's, um, well, that's well, this, where I this stand. Supports, this supports Michigan growers, that's for sure, uh, going this direction. They wanted it. Overwhelmingly, they wanted it. Had they not wanted it, it had been a different vote for me. But the overwhelming majority, overwhelming majority, of all the agricultural organizations in Michigan said, this is the right way to go. We want to be able to compete. We don't want to be blocked out of sending our goods uh, to market in other countries. And uh, uh, we are in a global economy, and we have some challenges with that, but we also have some access if, if, we, uh, if we do smart things. And, and I believe this was the right way to go, and I think it will be proven out. And then we have our various well, regulations. We'll keep an eye on it, Congressman. We've got to leave it right there security. for today, Congressman. Yeah, and I hope you're right about that. Congressman Tim Wahlberg, always a good conversation, robust as well today. We'll talk soon. The Steve Gruber Show, American Values, with Midwestern Common Sense. All righty, it's Thursday. Uh, pretty nice weather right now, but uh, make no mistake, those dark clouds you see on the horizon, those, um, well, I got bad news for you. Those come with snow. Someday soon. Yeah, that's the way it's going to be. There's snow on the horizon, and it's coming your way. And and so what happens in the winter? <clears throat> Oftentimes, people spend less time outside, obviously. They spend less time moving, and as a result, they don't feel as well. You know, they're not moving around as much. You're not getting as much activity, and you get, uh, well, you get depressed. You know, it's, uh, it's winter time, and it gets dark and miserable sometimes. But hey, how are we going to feel better all winter? We've got some ideas. Dr. Carrie Peterson here to talk about winter wellness with us today and, and maybe uh, cheer you up a little bit. Doctor, welcome to the program. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Good morning. It is a good morning. Uh, you know, and it's been real nice here. Uh, highs in the 60s and lows in the 40s. It's really a beautiful time of the year in this part of the country with fall weather and so forth. But we all know we all know when we glance to the west, we see those dark clouds that, you know, someday soon we're going to see snow flurries, and then after that, six inches of snow, and before that, uh, not too long, we'll have a snow day. And, you know, people get a little bit depressed in the winter in, in colder climates sometimes, and they have uh, different challenges. But you have some ideas on how to combat that and make us feel better all winter long. I do, Stephen, and um, I'm glad that you guys are having great weather out there. It certainly is warm for this time of year. I'm enjoying it here in New York City myself. Mm-hmm. Well, give so me one an idea. thing I wanted, yeah, one thing I wanted to talk about with all our listeners is uh, one thing that we tend to neglect when it comes to our overall health is our dental care. And this may come as a surprise hmm. to people. Why am I talking about dental care? But our oral health really is uh, an important part of taking care of ourselves. We can get early tooth and gum damage before we even know it exists. So I have lots of tips for people to take good care of your teeth. So I do recommend that you see a dentist twice a year for your cleanings. And I recommend that you brush your teeth twice a day and that you floss every single, every single day. And that's a habit a lot of people don't, don't do. And another important tool, just like we would condition our hair or we would uh, get our nails taken care of at the manicure salon, it's also important with your teeth to use the right toothpaste. And uh, I prefer Colgate Total Daily Repair Toothpaste. I'd like to recommend that to all our listeners. It mm -hmm. proactively does a lot of things for our mouth. It helps reverse and repair early damage to teeth and gums. It reverses gingivitis. It remineralizes weakened enamel, which will strengthen your teeth. And it continues to work even after you finish brushing your teeth. So I like to consider it an important tool for taking care of your mouth. And if you follow all these steps, you can be assured that your dental care will be optimized. Do you think people uh, spend less time, uh, you know, I mean, do they lose track of their teeth in the wintertime, or, or, or is this, uh, 
you know, this is a, a health tip for, for year-round. I, I would say in the wintertime, people tend, like you said, to feel a little more blue. They want to stay indoors more. They tend not to take care of their health as well. It's also cold and flu season, so there a lot of people are, are sick. They're not necessarily getting out of the house. So I do find when I do physicals on my patients, I always ask them about their dental health, and I do find that in the winter they neglect all of their health issues, not just their teeth and gums. Now, why do you think that happens? I mean, is it just because it's like a, a seasonal depression, a retinal depression issue? Um, what I mean, you know, obviously in New York City it's kind of gloomy and gray the same as it is here. Uh, do you think that's part of the problem? People just don't want it. They're just miserable because they don't like the snow or they don't like the gray skies? Or, or what, are, what are the factors here? I definitely think, as you mentioned earlier, that seasonal depression is a factor. Um, seasonal affective disorder is a real thing when we have less exposure to light. Our mood is bluer. I find a lot of my patients suffer from it and it keeps them indoors. They just don't have the interest in participating in life that they do the rest of the year, not to mention it's freezing out and <laughs> people have to get outside to get things done in their lives and they don't necessarily want to go in the cold. Maybe in the Midwest you guys are a little more used to it, but I can tell you in New York City, being that it's a pedestrian town, you have to walk everywhere and people don't like to go outside in this in this type of weather. So no, no, no. People in New York City are, are, yeah, people in New York City, doctor, are weak. You see, that's our, that's our take I, on I it. We, didn't go we are, compared to you guys, are <laughs> much more resilient when it comes to being able to tolerate the yeah. cold. And, and also, it's cold and flu season. And um, so it's really important that you take good care of yourself to try to prevent the cold and flu, if it's even possible. But winter colds are a big part of it as well. You know, people are sick this time of year, very frequently, I've already started to see at this time of year the number of patients on my schedule for respiratory infections goes up dramatically, and that's another big factor that causes people not to. Is that because in part, and we're on the line, uh, or, or under the weather? We're on the line. Yeah, we're on the line with Dr. Kerry Peterson here, uh, talking about winter wellness, and you talk oh, about I the cold and flu season. You, you talk about the cold and flu season and so forth, there, doctor. And, and is it because it? In the winter, the huddled masses are huddled a little bit closer together? Well, there are several factors for uh, people getting cold and flu this time of year. One is that you are indoors in a closed environment more, and so it's easier to spread germs. Um, another is that when the temperatures drop, the viruses prosper. They love this type of cold temperature, and they thrive, and they, they tend to grow more readily. Um, the problem with a cold is that there is no cure for a cold. Their antibiotics don't work for it, and so people tend to be sicker a little longer. So I'd love to give advice to all our listeners about what you can do if you do get a cold, because there are some steps that you can take to shorten the duration of your cold. There is no cure, but what I do recommend to my patients is that at the first sign of a cold, to use Coldies cold remedy lozenges. Not sure if you're familiar with them, but they've been clinically proven in studies. They will shorten the duration of your cold by almost half. Um, and they have a classic cherry zinc lozenge. That's really the most popular one. And you, you suck on it, and they have zinc ions in them, which adhere to the back of your throat and prevent the cold virus from replicating. And it will shorten the duration of your cold, like I said, by almost half. And then they also have one that if you have cough and congestion, and you need some relief for those symptoms as well, then they have a coldies multi-symptom quick melt that dissolves in your mouth and you don't need water. And it has added active ingredients to make you feel a little better. But um, like I said, the coldies will shorten the duration of your cold, but even with that, you can still get the cough, the congestion, you can get fever. They have tips for fever as well. You know, you take a medication for fever, when you have a cold or flu, it takes a little while for the medication to kick in. Um, but there's actually a product available called Be Cool Soft Gel Sheets, and they, it's, like a, it's an adhesive. You put it on your forehead, and it provides an instant cooling relief, and it lasts for up to eight hours. It's really convenient for, for moms to use for their kids. And what was that one called, this you, thing you put on your forehead? What's, what, what is that called? It's called Be Cool Soft Gel Sheets. They, they provide this an instant cooling relief. They bring your temperature down, and they last for up to eight hours. Um, they have an adhesive, and they're not messy. And it's, I, I think it's great for moms to use for kids. It's, it's 
not medication, um, and it's also not messy. A lot of moms will try a wet washcloth that's cold. And right, it's a lot easier then. Uh, doctor, I, um, I, I greatly appreciate the tips. Water. Greatly appreciate the tips from Dr. Carrie Peterson. We have to run. We're up against the wall here, Doctor, but uh, good tips, and I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Keeping you in touch with Michigan and the world. That's right. Step right up and listen to a concerned citizen speak his peace. All right. Welcome back to it. It is 45 after the hour on this 22nd of October. Now, I need to apologize for our, for our last interview. Don't normally do this, but I do apologize for that. You see, uh, when we put these programs together, we, we, um, we aggregate a variety of sources. Apparently, the person that had booked uh, the doctor in the previous segment thought this was the home shopping network. It's not. And the doctor, unfortunately, will never be back on the program. You see, we're here to talk about ideas, and we're here to talk about information. We're not here to pitch products. And apparently, the doctor didn't understand the premise of the program, which is um, common sense radio, not um, you know, 50% off. Uh, shop now that's not the premise just so we're clear on that so i apologize for the previous interview we won't have that problem again and and trust me if you come here to uh just shamelessly pitch products it's 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 not what we're going to do want to talk about a book you want to talk about something you're involved with that's a different thing all right speaking of which alexandria kincaid here author of a new book which is fair and free game and host of the gun law podcast here to talk about the candidates who have, uh, well, they're unabashedly saying, you know, we're coming after your, your guns. In fact, Hillary Clinton here recently said, you know, Australia is a good example. Canada is a good example. You know, in Australia, they went and confiscated all the guns. They did the same thing in the UK, the same thing in South Africa. By the way, South Africa's murder rate continues to be multiples of the American murder rate. Uh, and But these, um, these Marxists, uh, that are running for president under the Democratic flag have no no qualms whatsoever about uh, taking on your guns. Alexandra Kincaid, welcome to the program. Good morning, Steve. Thanks for having me. Uh, glad to have you here. You know, and, and here's the thing. You know, Bernie Sanders, um, Martin O'Malley, Hillary Clinton, they don't care. They, they've, they finally dropped all pretenses. They're coming after us. Well, you're right. They are Marxists. They don't care. They, that's exactly right. I, mean, I call them for what they are. People say, how can you call them a Marxist? Well, I, I do because, well, it's it's accurate. You know, no, they don't I, want private property. Exactly. They want the means of production to be held by the government. They want the banks to be held by the government. They want the decisions to be made by the government for health care and education and, and job placement. They want it all done by the government. That's Marxism. It is. And they are even going so far as to indoctrinate our children in the school system, which, again, back to Marxism and back to, um, you know, let's talk about Germany and what Hitler did. Same thing, right? Yeah. Well, Karl Marx said, give me your children for four years, and I can change the world. That's what he said. I mean, that's a tenet of Marxism. Give me your children for four years. Exactly. And, let's and I can change the world. And, you know, they, they want Americans to believe that they should rely on the government for absolutely everything, including defending your life. And, of course, we know the government isn't there to do that. You need to take some responsibility and be able to do it yourself, and that's why we have the Second Amendment. You know, the, the really offensive part about all this, uh, uh, Alexandria, is that uh, they sit there and tell you that the reason that the Soviet Union didn't work or China didn't work or, you know, Cuba or Venezuela or, or wherever, go pick your socialist failure, is because there wasn't enough government. I mean, that's really what they, there wasn't enough. We need more of it. We, we, we were almost there. We failed so miserably. But if we had just had more government and more taxes and more income equality... Which is more code speak for news speak, I think, is the way uh, it was put in 1984. News speak for Marxism. That's what it is. It is. And that is 100% premise behind the book Infringed, which is there are so many laws. Government is so big. The average gun owner doesn't even know which way to turn anymore. And I hear story after story from my clients and from other people about, you know, I'm moving or I want to give a gun across state lines. I have no idea what to do, so maybe I just gave all my guns away. Or, you know, I realized after I did something that I broke a law that I didn't even know existed. And I'm trying to help people understand that when you hear President Obama stand up and say, I'm going to take guns away from seniors who are on Social Security, he's not even talking about a new law. 
He's talking about a law that we've had in this country since 1968, and he's just trying to enforce it. Mm-hmm. It's selective enforcement of the laws, which is what is is it's most disgusting to me. When you talk about a broken immigration system, which it's not, it's just a failure to enforce laws, uh, or you've got a, a president that wants to enforce selectively the laws that he approves of and not the ones that he does not, uh, that's where we run it. This is a nation of laws. If we do not op- operate that way, it'll just be anarchy and chaos, and, well, I guess that's what we've got to a great extent. Alexandra Kincaid here, uh, author of uh, the hot new book, Infringe, and host of the Gun Law Podcast. Now, where do you live? I live in Idaho. God bless it. Now, the Salmon River is really good for trout fishing. You know, I'd like to be in Salmon River, you know, in, in August and, and catch rainbow trout. That's what I like about Idaho. How about you? Yeah, it's, I'm blessed to live here. That's all I can say. I don't fish yeah. too much anymore, but I love to hunt, and we have it all. Yeah, I, I, you know we're going to come find you in person next year when we're out fishing the uh, the Madison River in Montana. Maybe we'll slide over the Continental Divide and come see you. But uh, you you host the Gun Law Podcast. You uh, have this new book in French, and it's not just the Second Amendment. And here's where people uh, miss the boat, Alexandria. You see, when the Second Amendment goes away, the first is soon to follow. People don't understand the connection. If you lose your ability to protect yourself, then they say, well, you've got hate speech, or you've offended somebody, or you can't do this, and you can't say that. Uh, the rest is soon to follow. Am I wrong? No, I think you're absolutely right, and we're actually already seeing a little bit of that happening, aren't we? We're trying to tell people what to believe and what to talk about, what they can and can't say. And I love that you said, you know, oh, I'm offended by that, because that's what we've become, a nation of being offended and trying to tell other people how to feel and think. Yeah, well, here's the thing. You know, when you have safe zones on college campuses because you might be offended by something somebody said. Oh, he said something I don't agree with and I and I don't and I just I'm gonna burst into tears. Shut up. It's grow college. Up, right? We have we have grow up. Right. Grow a set and here's the deal. We're adults. Adults have conversations about real topics. And you may not like the way I think and I might not like the way you think. And we have disagreements and sometimes we get loud and sometimes we get serious and sometimes we say funny things. But it's called an adult conversation. It's called the free exchange of ideas, which is what this country is built upon. And how you know, about building safe considering, zones. And how about actually considering someone else's ideas um, and giving some respect and deference to that and thinking and expanding your own horizons? Maybe you're wrong. Exactly. You know? Yeah, well, well, I'm not, I'm not wrong too often. I'm not wrong either. So. Well, once in a while. A- Alexandra Kincaid, it's been a real pleasure. The book is infringed. Uh, you can find it online, and uh, yeah, you're welcome back anytime, my friend, anytime. Thank you very much. My pleasure.